Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is here. And today I have a special Tea Time. As you can see on the board, we have two incredible couples that have joined Miss Liz. And we're going to be talking about relationship and intimacy today um, and sexual enlightenment, all of that good stuff, but good stuff with the couples. So for all the couples out there that are listening and tuning in today, uh, I really appreciate you guys for tuning in. Um, I really wanted to do something different and I like to switch it up from time to time on tea time to keep you guys on your toes and see where Miss Liz is going to go. So, and these two incredible guests, uh, couples have really changed my life and helped me along the way as well and become friends. So let's get a little bit of uh, the disclaimer going and then the bios and we're going to get them in. And today we're going to have a double dose of teaching, enlightenment and love action and intimacy that's the teas that we're serving today we're serving a lot of strong cup of teas out there but before we get started with all of that we're going to get you over to miss liz's youtube channel we're going to get you to ring that little doorbell and you'll be notified when there's a tea time live or you can join the live stream and put your questions comments and support in that as well if any of these tea times resonate with you as well a little quick share with a friend or family or a co-worker it always helps and it helps my guests as well and you can connect with each and every one of them. So let's get started with the disclaimer for Miss Liz. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to, to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutic advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, original dates for tea times are Thursdays, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a special surprise or a rescheduled tea time. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit on couple number one. Couple number one is Linda and Charlie Bloom, our seminar leaders, authors, and psychotherapists, and are considered experts in the field of human relations. They have been working with individuals, couples, and groups throughout the country and internationally since 1975, and have been featured in speakers, featured speakers at many professional conferences. They are co-authors of five books, including the widely acclaimed An End to Arguing, 101 Valuable, Valuable Lessons for All Relationships, and 101 Things I Wish I Knew When I Got Married, Simple Lessons to Make Love Last with Over 100,000 Copies Sold. Their newest book, Love, is, Love in a Time of Crisis, is available now. They have been together for 54 years, have two children and three grandsons. They live in Santa Cruz, California. Now, a little bit on my second guest. Well, my second couple is Dr. Lisbeth Murth and Freddie Zentel Weaver have assisted thousands of couples and singles created lasting intimacy and fulfillment in their life and relationships. They are featured on Showtime documentary series, Sexual Healing, and the Emmy Award-winning NBC show, Starting Over best-selling authors of sexual enlightenment endorsed by world-renowned spiritual pioneer, Dr. Michael Beckwith. 
They are the co-founders of Tra Tan Tantra Nova Institute in Chicago and original original originators of June's first National Intimacy Day. Elizabeth and Freddie are have coached billionaires, innovators, and power couples all over the world, shared their intimacy secrets at a global YPO, Young Presidents Organization Conference in the city of Love, Paris, and got nominated as changemakers at the White House sponsored in 2016 United States Women's Summit in Washington, D.C. Lisbeth and Freddie Zentel are beloved husband and wife, as well as business partners residing in Chicago. So let me get the two couples in here and let's have some strong tea today on relationships and intimacy. So welcome, Linda and Charlie. Hi. And welcome, Lisbeth and Freddie. Welcome, guys. Hi, Liz. Hello. It is an honor to have you guys back. I really wanted to do this tea time to reach out to the couples out there. Uh, as we spoke a little bit before we went live on each couple uh, has their own way of, uh, you know, the secret, that magic secret that everybody says, what's the secret to a long lasting relationship? So I'm going to go to Linda and Charlie first, and then I'm going to jump to Lisbeth and Freddie. And we're going to pop up and down and we're going to go. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section or private DM Miss Liz on her Facebook page. And I'll get those questions out to the couples as well today. Um, and if you'd like to stay anonymous, the best way is to just message Miss Liz through my Facebook page. So now I'm going to get to Linda and Charlie. Linda and Charlie were on season four with Miss Liz, um, and they came to me and shared their books. Uh, I want Linda has the book, and we're going to talk about that book. So Linda, if you want to hold that book up, I'm just going to pop them up. So you're not going to see Miss Liz for a few minutes. You're going to see Linda and Charlie, and I'm going to let them do their thing. So I'm going to let them break the ice for you guys. So we wrote this book, An End to Arguing, because we've worked with so many couples over the years who have clashes in opinions and styles of being in the world, even core values. And we are a couple of recovered hotheads. Back in the day, we used to argue a lot. We're both first born. We were very definite about how we saw things and we're really different. And it took a toll on our relationship. It took a toll on our emotional intimacy that we clashed so much. But we're good students. So we paid attention and we got tremendous help from people who were in the graduating classes ahead of us who taught us about how to get vulnerable with each other, how to repair when we blurted things out that were judgmental and critical and hurt the other person. And so one of the things that we do in this book is to pay it forward. So we got such good help. We feel a sense of responsibility to help other people who struggle with difficulty. If you have harmony and cooperation with some challenge in your relationship, that sets the stage for more emotional intimacy and the greatest, most fulfilling sex. Mm -hmm. I'm from the school of thought that foreplay is everything that we did since the last time we had sex till this time. And so it's about the context of the relationship, being in flow, the channels not clogged up and that there is uh, feelings and needs and safety and challenge characterizing the relationship. Yeah. Well, I agree with everything she just said, <laughs> uh, which is one of the secrets of great relationships. <clears throat> but um, also uh, when um when we look at, you know, what is it that really creates um, a healthy bond uh, in a passionate, juicy, uh, intimate relationship? <clears throat> One of the things that we have found that really makes a huge difference that people often underestimate is the background in which that um, opportunity is being issued. And, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about is 
what kind of shape are you in emotionally in your relationship? Are there any incompletions that need to be attended to? Because one of the one of the biggest obstacles in having a great relationship isn't necessarily not knowing what the technical things are that you need to do. Um, it's not even about more information. It's really more about how clean is that space between the two of you? How safe is it? How complete are you with, uh, with each other? Are there any unresolved issues? And of course, there are always going to be some things, but is there anything that's really gnawing on one or both of you that you really can't just put aside uh, because it, it needs attention? So, um, you know, being mindful of uh, and honest with yourself and with each other uh, about, you know, how are we doing? Uh, where where are you? You know, is there anything that we need to, you know, talk about? And not necessarily just when, <clears throat> when you're anticipating having an intimate connection, but in general, to staying current with each other so that when those moments arise in which spontaneously or premeditatedly, you, you have uh, an opportunity to really connect with each other uh, emotionally, physically, sexually, in whatever way that, uh, that may be at the time. So there isn't anything that's in the way that's distracting you, pulling your awareness away from being present mindfully in this moment. So that, you know, when, when we feel safe, when we feel that uh, there isn't anything that is competing with our desire to be connected right now, we can really bring our complete selves forward and, uh, and be vulnerable, which, of course, probably I'm sure most of you are aware that that's the primary factor as far as being able to connect deeply and intimately mm -hmm. is, is to feel vulnerable. And to feel vulnerable, to allow yourself to experience vulnerability, you've, you've got to feel like it's safe for me to be vulnerable. Mm. So uh, we really uh, you know, encourage people to look not just at what the experiences that you're anticipating and want to have, but also to look at where are you right now? Are you available? Are you receptive? Are you safe and feeling open? Hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, guys. And we're gonna we're gonna have questions coming in. I will get to the questions, but I just want to get the couples to share a little bit on uh, their books and that. Uh, Freddie and Lisbeth, I'm gonna pop you guys up. You guys have the sexual enlightenment book, and I want to talk about sexual enlightenment. We're talking about intimacy, relationship, and all of that stuff. Um, yes, it. If you feel that this conversation is a little not um, not age appropriate, I, I, I do request that you step out and tune into another tea time. Today, I think that this is a topic that really needs to come to the table. So I'm going to get the second couple up and get them to talk a little bit about their book. And then we're going to get the questions that are coming in and, and that out to the couples. And we're going to have a deep conversation today on intimacy, relationships, sexual enlightenment, all that good stuff. So let me pop up Freddie and Lisbeth and they can share a little bit on their book and their relationship as well. Thanks, Liz. All right. As you already heard, our book is called, oops, 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 Sexual Enlightenment, How to Create Lasting Fulfillment in Life, Love and Intimacy. So I just want to expand a little bit on Charlie's and uh, Linda's contribution and um, expand it further into what we call the trilogy of mind, heart, and life force center. The life force center is where our pleasure center, the sexual center, um, where creative energy emanates from. And when we feel whole and connected within, we are integrated and coherent in sex, heart, and mind. Mm -hmm. And then we bring this to relationship. Mm 
So all of what Linda and Charlie shared in terms of emotional intimacy, we get go further into then sexual intimacy. We can have sex without being intimate. However, if we want to have true sexual intimacy, which is an kind of integrated intimacy, the heart wants to be connected with the sex and the sex wants to be connected with the heart, both within and with each other. Absolutely. You know, um, yeah, what Linda and Charlie shared in terms of intimacy is the key. And it's one of the main things that we work with when couples and individuals come to uh, take workshops or work individually with us. And one of the things that's unique about our approach is teaching sexual meditation. Uh, the thing that's unique about that is, first of all, who doesn't like, you know, that feeling of that intimacy and that vulnerability and that love and that open, you know, just really just carefreeness that happens in the orgasmic and that intimate moment uh, with ourselves or with a partner. Now, that's an altered state of awareness. So what we're teaching is how to work consciously with that, you know, more endorphin, serotonin, and oxytocin, the feel-good hormones, the emotional intimacy and connectedness that happens with uh, particular distinctions around breath, awareness, energy awareness, and intention. Like I want to stop arguing with my beloved, or I want to create a beloved, or work that's fulfilling, or a place that's inspiring, whatever it might be. We get more unmasked to what is running in the background that we don't see that often keeps us from allowing in what we most deeply desire. And we've had really great um, results with people in our workshops that people get actionable insights. And oftentimes they come with already an idea of what they want. So now learning how to get out of their own way uh, as a witness, a curious witness of themselves to keep moving towards this thing that they most deeply desire. And the practice can be done as a solo practice, which we highly recommend because I cannot connect intimately with Freddie if I'm not connected intimately with myself. So when I'm angry with Freddie, the last thing I want is to connect intimately with him or him coming to me wanting to connect intimately, you know. So I want to recalibrate over here and Ultimately, I'd love to live in a state of bliss and harmony within myself. This is where life is becoming wonderful. And this is what then emanates into the relationship, into Freddie's heart, you know. And then in the tantric practice, there are very particular ways of circulating our energies with each other consciously, mm -hmm. like it could be circulating through the sixth chakra from, you know, mind to mind, consciousness to consciousness. It could be from heart to heart, where we connect with like, would you give me your hand? Mm -hmm. No, this one here. Mm -hmm. You cannot see it so well, like here, you know, where we connect and then we send energy and breathe together in synchronicity. You probably can already feel how that brings a couple into unity, into connection. And then, of course, also the connection from our sexual center to the other sexual center. And then we can breathe it up and circul circulate it just like this, up from his sexual center into his heart, from his heart into my heart. When my heart opens, my sexual center or yoni opens, now, which is the Sanskrit word for sexual center of a woman. Yoni means sacred space, and I particularly love that. You know, the thing of it is that these practices are really um, very familiar, even if it's the first time you've, you know, practiced them, because it's reminding us of what we've forgotten which is that stillness and that intimacy. Once we can start to develop a practice of being a witness, a curious witness of these stories that we live in and the uh, cascading effect that these stories have on our energetic self, then we can start to recognize that stuff, use these somatic practices to remind us of a place and then move towards whatever our senior commitment is that we want to uh, create in our relationship or our life. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing that. And thank you for uh, the little exercises. Uh, we have some uh, 
listeners that have some questions that are coming in. So I'd like to get those in, but I'm going to ask both couples and I, we're going to kind of keep the couples on the screen together. Cause I, I really want to keep that connection. I want to see the different expressions and, and feels and, and that to each question. So I'm going to pop the question up so you guys can see the question that popped into the studio. So this one is, do you think age and stage of life, young kids working retirement affected your early fights? I'll speak to that about when you're tired, when you have young children, because we were trying to do two careers and um, three little kids. I think that the fuse was short just from fatigue. And uh, I don't have too many regrets about my life, but I do regret that we didn't do more date nights when the children were small and particularly regret that we didn't do more romantic getaways. And so I always tell our students or our clients who are still raising children to prioritize their relationship and put it in the number one spot and go off, get, get good child care, throw some money at the challenge and just be the two of you with some romantic time. And when the children were small and we were working and raising the kids, do you know the first day that we would do our romantic getaway, we would need to sleep and nap. We were so tired. But then the second day we could catch up and we could share and we could have that emotional mm -hmm. give and take. That's the great aphrodisiac, you know, that emotional intimacy. And then we could have the great sex. Mm -hmm. And we, we did do some of that but i think that when you take more time to protect the well-being of your romantic and sexual partnership when you come back from those getaways you come back with a full soul tank and the kids look so cute and then you're in harmony about raising them the rest of the way and so that's what i would recommend that it heads off arguments when you're really beautifully connected with each other and you can get to some of the topics and head off trouble at the pass if you take time away from all the competing urgencies to deal with them. And then they don't have to erupt into ugly arguments. Yeah, we, we're finding this, ourselves using uh, the, this term um, competing commitments um, that come up um, you know, throughout our relationship, but particularly in the early days when uh, when we have kids or when they're, you know, our careers are important for us to fulfill. All of these responsibilities and commitments um, are competing with the desire to to be more connected with each other. I mean, after all, that's part of what caused us to make the choice of being together in the early days and the early stages uh, of infatuation when we're just, you know, can't imagine ever even having an argument with this person <laughs> um, or when we're more available because we don't have as many uh, commitments that, that we have to fulfill or we, we may not have as, as many, that um, at those times, we have this hope, expectation, vision maybe that uh, causes us to want to make the commitment to be with this person that I just can't imagine us ever not, or myself ever not feeling this way. Um, but life has this tendency to happen. <laughs> and when it happens, there's all kinds of new things that enter into it and responsibilities. And um, and also our uh, kind of ability, you know, to our bandwidth can diminish because there's more and more stuff taking space in it. So we may find ourselves with less patience, um, uh, being more uh, judgmental, um, feeling less. Uh, that there's less uh, available for me to give to this 
part of myself. Because when we're when we're taking care of kids, when we're working, when we're uh, living our <clears throat> purposeful life, um, there's a certain way of being that we take on, you know, that's more purposeful, more goal oriented, uh, less present, if you will. And so we have to transfer uh, or recalibrate that way of being in a way that we can be with our partner in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. So going back and forth between these ways of being, uh, it's, you know, it can be challenging to do that. Uh, I remember when I was, um, when I was younger and I was in the uh, early days of my career, um, where I had to maintain a certain kind of a presence and image, um, I would come home sometimes after a long trip and my way of being was still in the workplace. I, I hadn't yet completely disengaged from that uh, attitude that I had to carry with me at work. Uh, Cause I was, I was gone usually for a week at a time and it had been pretty deeply integrated into me. And sometimes I would come home and, uh, I would I would be bringing that same attitude, and uh, you know, Linda would have to remind me sometimes. Hey, you know, take off your work hat because you know, you're here as a as a partner and as a dad now. I mean, she wouldn't say it quite that <laughs> nicely, but I get the message. <laughs> so, uh, right before the fight started, you got the message, Charlie. <laughs> Yeah. Lizard and Freddie, I'm going to give you guys the same question. Uh, I'll bring it up again. So do you think age and stage of life, young kids working retirement affected your early fights? Well, we, uh, we, we met later in life. We were in our mid and late 40s. We've been together for 24 years now. And almost six months to the day, we what I call transcended the romantic drama uh, we were both in corporate America and had had careers and that I was in the software business and Elspeth was in international business consulting. And we were both looking, I was looking for something that was much more invigorating and vitalizing and engaging than what I'd been doing in the software business for 15 years. Uh, and so, you know, we, we created this work is what, we, this is the baby we had. So we really didn't have a lot of fights. We had a lot of excitement and energy and creativity and intimacy, creating what we've been doing for the last, you know, 25 years all over the world uh, and so on. So, you know, our, our fights are few and in between. When they happen, they're quick uh, and they're quickly gone. Uh, and these practices uh, of being the witness of what, and, you know, uh, what I'm stuck in, something happens and then uh, it's there, our, you know, honestly and authentically. And then pretty quickly, I've scanned myself and I'm now choosing to shift that energy. And so, you know, stuff doesn't stop happening. It just doesn't stick around as long then or now. <laughs> Key of all of this, what all of you just said so far, Charlie, Linda and Freddie, is practice. Mm, moment by and moment. Yeah. to practice by myself and practice in the relationship like this presence Charlie talks about. Presence is the greatest gift that we can give to ourselves, mm -hmm. our beloved or a child, because that's the because it shows up in the moment. And the moment is the only thing we have. And so cultivating presence has something to do then or influences my awareness, awareness of self and then also awareness of the other. So do how do we create presence? How do we bring forth awareness? <clears throat> and that can only happen when I become self-reflective, when I look at myself and the other part is, of course, and have practices with myself and with Freddie. Like when he said, you know, things don't stop happening. However, the fights may not last that long. But mm -hmm. it has been cultivated, you know, mm -hmm. and consciously cultivated. Because 
it really has to do with what is my intention for my life and my relationship? Am I committed when things don't go the way I want them to go, when Freddie doesn't give me what I want from him, whatever domain it may be in, you know, I can get pissed off, I can get very angry, I can, you know, fall back into when I didn't get something from my parents when I was five years old, <coughs> as far as the experience is concerned. How do I move myself into a state of presence where I then can discern Elspeth mm -hmm. committed to being angry and self-righteous that Freddie is wrong and I'm right fundamentally, that is always in the background, mm -hmm. or am I more committed to harmony in the relationship? Mm -hmm. And usually the latter, you know, wins out. But that I had to work a lot on me and on myself. And the tantric practice has helped me and has supported our relationship in coming to our belly breath, which allows us by activating the belly, the feel good hormones get activated. So instead of staying in that impulse of anger, the hormones help me to calm down a little bit. And when I can bring my focus on the breath, that gives me a little pause. And in that pause, I ask myself the question, Elspeth, are you committed? to being right, or are you committing to being connected and in harmony with body, uh, with Freddie, with body too? With yeah, Freddie. with body, absolutely, <laughs> first, first. <laughs> and what we do is we remind each other of that and we have the permission. We wouldn't be able to do it in the moment of heat to remind each other. Yep. If we hadn't given each other permission before the intensity. Yeah, one of the keys to this is, you know, owning your upsets, the ener energy of the upset. Not that there may not be a request to be made or something that you want to work out. It's the anger, the upset, the make wrong, the feeling done to that we have to own as individuals to be able to either let it go or make a request or, um, you know, change something. Transmute it. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. What I really like about the two couples is the age gap, right? Is Linda and Charlie been together 54 years? Uh, Lisbeth and Freddie, you've been together 24 years. So there's almost that a 25 year gap, right? But you're both speaking on the same stuff. You're still talking about being present, being connected, you know, having that communication. Uh, we have a question here for young couples that first get together. How can we have a healthy talk about intimacy and what we, what our preferences are, what our likes are, what our dislikes are. How can we start that conversation? Great question. And we define intimacy as in, to, me, see. And if you look up in the dictionary, intimacy, it says innermost. So we have intimate conversations with only a small handful of people who are precious to us the trusted ones, the confidants. And we will show those people that they are on our special list, on the A list. And I will let you see into me. I will let you see my feelings, all of them. I'll let you see my anger. I'll let you see my desire. I will let you see my insecurities and my fears and my loneliness. I will let you see my wildest dreams for my life, my ambition, and my needs, my feelings, and my needs. And I don't talk with other people just any old body like this. I choose to create the kind of trust where we don't have any no-fly zones, where there are no taboo subjects. And it's a practice because many people did not have any models in their family of origin where they really spoke from their heart and did get vulnerable and spoke about their fears and what hurt them and what disappointed them and their wild dreams for their life. And you must practice to get good at it. Just like the uh, accomplishment of business 
professionals that are at the top of their field or musicians or athletes, they put in their 10,000 hours of practice. And so to sit with our beloved and to have conversations, Charlie and I for decades have been having a daily check-in with each other. No matter where we are in the world, we talk, we Zoom, we, you know, we meet each other. Uh, usually we do it first thing in the morning. Um, I'm a touchaholic, so we do it with skin time in it so that we're um, in, in bodily contact with each other. And we might talk about what's going on during the day. Maybe we'll discuss uh, cases that we're working with. Maybe we'll speak about anything that's bothering us because we have this intolerance for incompletion. And all of the couples that we're working with, we're inviting them. They, they sometimes don't check in with each other at all. They're living such parallel lives. To start with once a week and just check in with yourself, have an intimate moment with yourself and then report out and reveal rather than conceal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to help people work up their courage to reveal themselves to each other. And when they start having some successes, they want to do it more mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the um, four words that strike terror into most men's hearts, and it could be women too, but it's more often than, than not men, is we need to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's like, oh, God, I got to get out of here. I got to go. I got to go. That is, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> that is the very worst way to begin a conversation about some of the topics that you know, we're talking about here. Um, and, and the way you introduce that desire, that invitation, makes such a big difference in terms of where it's going to go from there. Because if there's um, a sense of a threat in what the person receives when you're speaking, um, if there's uh, something in it that doesn't feel inviting or comfortable or caring. They want to uh, run to yeah. the hills. <laughs> yeah. The garage is calling me. <laughs> uh, at the very least, they're going to get defensive. And and um, once somebody gets defensive, it, it, you know, it takes a little time and work if you can't, you know, to, to cool them down. And they may not be cool downable at that time. They may have already gotten plugged into, oh, shit, here it comes again, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to keep in mind that this is an invitation, not a directive, not something that you're telling the person that they need to do um, to, to provide them with something that might be appealing, you know, and also to let them know, and this is really imp important, um, that what you what you want in this conversation, I like to have a conversation um, about something that's really meaningful to me. Do you have time for it? Just to check to see if they're available. <clears throat> and if they are, um, to make it clear, this is my intention. This is my intention in having this conversation. This is what I want to have happen. I'm hoping to have happen. And just getting started on that foot, um, saying something in your intention that the other person will hear as being a benefit to both of you, that, that's a great start. And if you start off on the right foot and you, you know, try to keep your directives and your judgments uh, out of the conversation and just speak from your desires, your needs, your hopes, your care for the relationship and for your partner, mm -hmm. you're more likely to stay on track. And Lisbeth and Freddie, how do you feel about that for young couples? That How did they get the conversation going? Oh, wow. So um, I'm just recalling um, a couple that came to us recently for a three-month 
private program. Mm -hmm. And um, they were, I mean, I had a phone call with her before, you know, they even came. And she was, you know, almost ready to, I mean, this is not working any longer. You know, really resigned, despaired, and resentful. And so she brought her husband in. Her husband was very gung-ho to get the work going, which is not necessarily a given. And so they came together. And in the process of working with us, they found each other again. And it really happened through the learning of each other what their heart's desire is. Heart's desire in an emotional sense, how they want to feel, how they want to feel being connected. And that may be different for a woman from a man or from for the one who is more in their yin energy or feminine energy, could be a same-sex couple, you know. It's so always one more in their feminine and the other more in their masculine. I'm not talking across the board in the relationship, but in the intimate field, that is usually how it shows up. If that polarity is not there of yin and yang or feminine and masculine, there is no attraction, there is no magnetism. So for her, it was really for that couple who came to us was really to be listened to what is important to her, both in an emotional sense, sense and also in a sexual sense. Because often, you know, when a man wants, when two partners want to connect with each other, most men start feeling it in their sexual center. Most women or the one who is in their feminine, when they want to connect, they start feeling it in their heart center. We have the same intention, which is we want to connect. Yet he, he, he feels it from his sexual center. She feels it from her heart center. So we are like two ships passing in the night. And so the awareness then for that couple was that the men started to listen to her from a whole different place, mm -hmm. not necessarily just where he is automatically coming from, which is totally fine for him, but not a connector to his beloved. And for her, what she opened up to was what he wanted actually was to feel safe in her presence which was actually not so much her thing, but she needed to be aware of because that was not feeling safe was something that he brought from his earlier time of his life that then kicked in in the relationship. So the listening back to how can we open up intimate conversation, emotional sexual intimate conversation is that we start listening to each other and then listening to the differences mm -hmm. because if i cannot listen to what freddie is about i never will get him and he doesn't feel gotten and that is the antidote of opening particularly intimately mm. yeah for the man particularly uh the uh, polarity dance you know, because for men, we're kind of modeled uh, and sort of wired to, uh, you know, show two emotions. That's, excuse my French, fucking or fighting. You know, mm -hmm. so intimacy, vulnerability, uh, nurturing is like not considered okay for men. Don't cry kind of a thing. So in the practices that we're, uh, you know, exposing, teaching, sharing, uh, men start to get a broader opportunity of experience with their emotional selves. And that really opens up a lot as a, as a listener to themselves, firstly, and then able to sit and be with their partners uh, when they're in the emotional states. Um, and so that dance can happen a little more fluidly. Uh, and then they can get to back to the love, you know, which is ultimately what we want to do. Um, so it's really been fun sharing this with people and seeing what happens because, again, 
it's not anything new. It's just remembering the stillness. Because we started out in the womb. It was womb service, you know. And we were just floating in the embryonic fluid, and it was effortless and free and fun. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, we're born. Some guys are getting whacked in the bottom and getting their wee-wees cut, you know. And you're thinking, if you could, send me back. And then life happens, all this good and bad and ups and downs. And then we get to a point in our life at some point where we want to create something that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. Our connection to this elegant design of a universe that goes on forever. And so the practices of starting to live into the dream that we're dreaming for our lives is a great opportunity. And it's been great to see that unfold with people and myself. Well, we have a question here for the men, uh, and I'm going to pull it up. Uh, so this is for Charlie and Freddie. Uh, do men change how they share emotions with their wives as they age? Uh, I wouldn't say that it's inevitable that that happens. Um, I, th I think there's, you know, a lot of factors that, that determine what, how they, how they deal with the emotions. Um, feelings just come uninvited. I mean, there isn't really anything that we can do to control what feelings show up at any given moment. They seem to be just something that's in, uh, inherent in uh, what's going on within us and around us. And so they, they, they get activated. Um, so we don't have any, any control over deciding what we feel, what emotions we're, we're there. But we do have um, control over the way in which we respond to our emotions and from our emotions. And uh, hopefully in the process of maturing and, you know, particularly if we live in a, in a healthy relationship, we learn more productive, more responsible, more meaningful ways of, of responding. We become aware of, a, of our emotions. We can relate to them from a, a place of acceptance rather than judgmental. And that's going to change the way in which we react and respond to, to other people, particularly to our partner. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's, it's inevitable that, that feelings change or, you know, and change. But uh, hopefully we grow, we become more aware and that awareness enables us to make choices that were not available. Those options weren't available to us when we were younger. And all we knew was what we were bringing into our lives and our relationship <clears throat> that we learned from our families. Um, and if we're like most people, there are a lot of things that we uh, didn't learn that would have been helpful, but it's never too late. <laughs> and Freddie? Yeah, well, you know, in the beginning, back to the womb, you know, we're zygotes in the womb and it's decided man or woman. And, you know, as a man, we have more testosterone, women have more estrogen. And as we get older, the whole thing reverses itself. So biologically, you know, with aging, we get a little more mellow. So, you know, emotions may be there, but we may not strike out like we did when we were 20, when we were in our 60s or whatever, 80s or whatever. Um, so that can shift, yet the angst and the upset and the internal churning can still be there. So the practice of being really uh, self-aware, you know, just doing some parasympathetic breathing and watching the thoughts and just not reacting to the cascading effect of what happens with believing and falling uh, totally into our thoughts and, and stories and beliefs um, can shift. Uh, and that's really the opportunity for the man is to really start to get a handle on that and for the woman as well but particularly for the man in terms of the testosterone and how that can affect the stories and and beliefs and so on um yeah so that's that's all i got to say about that good charlie i think charlie pretty much handled it <laughs> yeah we have a question here uh if there is no sexual connection longer in the relationship can the relationship be repaired and continue so i have heard from multiple people over the years that once the fire goes out, it can't be rekindled. But I don't believe in that because I have seen the people who believe that the fire is completely gone and there may be some cold ash, but there can be an ember underneath. So it has to do whether there's a fierce commitment 
to find it, to reinvigorate it, to see how did it get so covered over that they really worried that it was gone forever. And I have seen it be rekindled. I'm not saying it doesn't take a lot of work. And I feel sad when I think about the people who let the sexual vibrancy go out of their relationship and give it up because I think it's such an enlivening energy and it's such a handy way to show love and to bring pleasure to each other's bodies. And people give up too soon and they often don't go see the professionals who could help them clear away that cold ash and to uh, help them not to be so afraid of each other and so distant of each other and at least make right effort to see if it could be rekindled slowly, respectfully, no force, all the invitation Maybe they start just with touching, just holding hands, just with emotional intimacy and build the safety and security and challenge because too much safety and security can get boring, you know, predictable and stagnant. There has to be a bit of edge of discovery and you need some courage to do that. But I have seen it rekindled. And so I believe that it's possible if people want to work. And how do you guys feel about that, Freddie and Elizabeth? So, you know, many couples come to us for that very reason. Not all, but, you know, quite a number. Also in mid-age, mid um, the kids have gone for college or, you know, and then they find themselves with each other and they are perhaps great friends. But that fire that Linda speaks about has left and so it's essential to connect with one's own fire because nobody can fire me up unless I'm connected with the fire within. Mm -hmm. And of course, in relationship, we can practice this together. Again, that leads me back to that space of safety because the sexual intimate connection or revealing is so delicate where we reveal ourselves. And so when we work with couples, no matter if they come to a workshop or if they work privately with us, for the beginning part, for quite a while actually, we just focus on emotional intimacy where sexual stuff may show up, but not hands-on practice. Because if we were to go to the hands-on practice right away, just the same stuff would open up, you know, because it has to do with the nervous system. And unless we recalibrate the nervous system, there's no change. And so to tap into that emotional intimacy that also leads us to open conversations with each other and with oneself mm -hmm. is the gateway into sexual rituals after they have done the, done the foundational work where they have reconnected their hearts or they're listening or speaking up what they want or what they don't want, what's important, what they may be afraid of. And um, so it's really a gradual leading either back to what may have been there once when they fell in love with each other. For some, it's actually a whole new discovery because they are not 20 anymore, they are not 30 anymore. You know, there's lots of maturity, wisdom in many ways that is then brought to that intimate connection and perhaps also to a clarity how we want to experience intimacy now, which may show up very differently, you know? Right. I was going to say, you know, designing a relationship because it starts out, oh my God, I just love everything about you, the way your feet smell and your underarms. Mm -hmm. I just love you. And then after about three years, you need to take a bath, okay? <laughs> it's never like it was or like it's going to be. It's like it is. So, you know, what practices can we employ that will keep us, you know, vibrant and alive and really being creatively Vesuvius and improvisational about this life that we're in together? Uh, 
uh, and it's, you know, it might be, you know, you know, you're monogamous at one point and then maybe you be open or maybe you're, you're, who knows? There's all kinds of approaches. So what do you have in the relationship that is the reason to be together? How do you assist each other in dancing more in this time? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where you can really start to look honestly at the relationship. And most of us are kind of in a fantasy about it, you know, some drama uh, in relationships. So, you know, just running to the next hottest sexual experience uh, is about, you know, two, three years. And then, you know, you're back with yourself again. Uh, so how can you use what you've uh, evolved with your relationship? You know, maybe you've got 10, 20 years in with each other. What works, what doesn't. I, I believe in relationship agreement where you actually, you know, put things uh, down yeah. and, and reevaluate them over I ha- six months. I have a footnote here <laughs> to what Freddie said, which is like it's by design what kind of relationship, also intimate relationship, we want to have together. What I mean by design, so when Freddie said we are monogamous and then if there is the wish to open up the relationship by design, not as an escape. Mm -hmm. Because that is just unconscious and, you know, it's not so great here, let me go somewhere else. And then as Freddie said, then I come back to myself, to my Mm -hmm. mystery, you know. By design, it's very different. And by design, the relationship design, Mm -hmm. it's about expansion. Because when we open up the relationship, that one or the other can also be with another lover, that requires a phenomenal mastery of both partners. Mastery of jealousy, of envy, Possessiveness. of you know, feeling abandoned at moments, or you know, all kinds of stuff may show up and only if you're willing to encounter yourself consciously there don't do it i mean you can do it as an escape but nothing is going to change what you may not like in your current relationship Mm -hmm. but i really what i'm really getting from today's conversation is presence and practice right right is be present with each other and practice and, you know, and have that contract of saying, you know what, you know, and the day and when we first got together, this is what we agreed on, but now we need to adjust that contract, right? We need to work and communicate and, and say, you know what, that's no longer serving me. That's no longer pleasing me, you know, big on communication and stuff like that. And the reason that I wanted to do this show today with, uh, with Linda and, Charlie and Freddie and Liz, but is I wanted to get the conversation started. I wanted the conversation of intimacy and relationship to start. I feel that in today's world, relationships are put on the back burner. We're not having these conversations. We're not reaching out. We're not taking these retreats and workshops and all of these incredible resources and services out there. Couples that are actually living it and saying, you know, if you, you put a little bit of spice in, you might just have an, a better cup of tea. You know, you might have a little sweeter tea or you might have a bitter tea, you know, because you're just not listening. You're, you know, listening skills and stuff like that. Um, I really want to give the, the couples a chance and put their workshops out and courses and stuff like that. Linda had said that she, they're doing something that yeah, they still have spots for. Uh, Freddie and Lisbeth always have courses and, and workshops going on as well. So I want to give you guys that chance to put that out. I'm going to put you guys up as solos and show your books again. We'll get those out. And your final message for everybody that's listening. And let's just keep the conversation going. Let's keep this tea flowing and let's keep sharing it. And reach out to my guests because that's what my guests are here for. They're not here just for a conversation. They're here for services and and to help you as well. So connect with my guests. All of their information will be in the in the in the description part and transcript. So check that out. But I'm going to pop up Linda and Charlie, give your last shout out for your workshops, your book and all that good stuff. And then we'll go to Lisbeth and Freddie and then we'll wrap it up and we'll keep the conversation going with the relationship and intimacy. So an end to arguing will uh, infuse your relationship with some passion of the wonderful kind, not the kind that drags you down. And Charlie and I are going to be in Massachusetts at Kripalu in the Berkshire Mountains. 
and there's room available and Kripalu is a wonderful place to visit. Yeah. We're go the last weekend of this month, we'll be there again the weekend before February and for people who like to come to Esalen in California, we'll be there on Valentine's weekend. But if you feel inspired, come and be with us at Kripalu and that would be uh, 25th, 26th, 27th, I think, whatever the last weekend of this month is. And my closing remarks are, there is more in it for each of us over and above emotional well-being. Of course, it's going to perk up our happiness when we have greater relationship skills and more emotional and sexual intimacy is vibrant and passionate, but we also get health and longevity effect from having the love cocktail flowing through our veins. <laughs> and so I just wanted to say that there is so much in it for us that is rewarding if we put some time and attention, make it a priority and do our work in this area. Yeah, real brief for me, um, just, thought of four words that I would say uh, are takeaways for me and, you know, maybe for you too. Um, presence, practice, persistence, and doing that will lead to peace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I love that. The four P's are bringing you to the good old piece of intimacy yeah. and relationships. I love it, Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll pop you guys up, Lisbeth and Freddie, and share your book again. Put it up, and we'll get it out there for you guys. Sexual Enlightenment, How to Create Lasting Intimacy in Love, Life. No, How to Create Lasting Fulfillment in life, love, and intimacy, available on our website, tantranova.com, T-A-N-T-R-A-N-O-V-A.com, tantranova, like supernova. Um, and when you scroll down, when you get to the homepage, all the way down, the book is at the bottom, just click there, and then you can purchase it on Amazon. It's available in audio book on audible so whatever you prefer uh, a great introduction to how you can start connecting with your sexual emotional intimate and spiritual being to become one within and one with your beloved and we want to invite you as a couple to come to our January 14th through 17th Secrets to Lasting Intimacy Workshop here at the Tantra Nova Institute in Chicago. Uh, and you can reach us at tantranova at tantranova.com or at the website tantranova.com. Just uh, you can schedule a, a complimentary consult. Uh, so, and then explore, you know, what that could mean for you, for your relationship, and how you could be supported to have new experiences and expanded experiences in love, life, and intimacy. Keep owning your upsets. Enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me and taking the time to sit and have this conversation. If anybody else would like to know more about intimacy, relationships, arguing, crisis, and all of that good stuff, I highly recommend these two couples. Check them out. Check out their tea times as well. Linda and Charlie were on on season four, and Lisbeth and Freddie were on on season five. So, uh, you know, check out the different seasons. Check out the different topics. And if you have any questions or you'd like me to connect you to these couples, reach out to Miss Liz at www.misslizesteatime.com uh, or my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Uh, I really want to thank you guys again for joining me and bringing this conversation to the table. And let's just keep flowing the tea. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of incredible relationships out there that need this tea. So keep sharing it with your friends, your family, co-workers, all of that good stuff. 
and check out these incredible workshops. Uh, I am really truly blessed to have you guys a part of my life and you guys help me more than you realize uh, with today, presence and practice and you know persistence and we'll bring peace. So thanks for that message, Charlie. Uh, Freddie, thank you for you know, bringing us back to the womb and understanding that it all starts right within us. So um, again, thank you guys. And I will see everybody back at 7 p.m. with the next Tea Time where Sean Bridges, a screenwriter and thriller author is going to be sharing his new book called The Gun Barrel Highway. So we're gonna talk about that. And that's about love as well and, and a deep relationship. So you wanna check that one out too. So until then, I will wish everybody a happy, day and keep staying true to yourself keep serving your tea we don't serve a beverage in this house we serve storytelling words and making a difference with one cup of tea at a time one story at a time so until then uh, stay stay true to yourself and we'll we'll make a difference with this tea so take care everybody thank you